All right, guys, without further ado, let me get into these 10 lessons. I've got them written down here, so you're going to see me if you're watching this on YouTube, which can be found on YouTube uh, at Order of Men. Uh, anyways, I'm, I'm take, I've got my notes here, so you're going to see me reference those notes. These are in no particular order. I just wrote them down as I thought about them this morning and thought about the lessons that uh, I extracted being there at the new facility in, 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 uh, in St. Louis. So let's get into it. Number one, uh, your customers are your customers, and so is your team. So I think about this a lot as a business owner. I think it's natural, of course, and obvious for us to focus a lot of our time and attention, resources, energy on marketing efforts, on getting new clients and getting new prospects and wowing our, our consumer, our customers. And that's important. I'm not saying it isn't, but we all know that's important. What I was impressed with, among other things, is that the leadership team, including, of course, Andy and Sal and, and the rest of the team, understand that not only are their customers their customers, and by the way, their customer service is bar none. I've, I've actually experienced it. Uh, but they realize that not only do they have a responsibility and obligation to take care of their customers, they have a responsibility and obligation to take care of their team. And they treat their team just as good, if not better, uh, then their customers, because they realize that that's where a lot of the value is derived from. They care about their teammates. They care about the people that are working there. It was evident to me that they've created an environment that's conducive to growth and expansion and learning and, and evolution in their, their teammates and team members. I don't know technically what they call them. Their family, I think is what they call them maybe. Uh, but they realize that taking care of the people that take care of you is crucial and critical. I've been in companies that, that understand this like they do. And I've been in companies that don't understand that. And all they care about is the bottom line. All they care about is the customer, which again, nothing wrong with caring about your customer. But if that comes at the expense of your employees, it comes at the expense of the people who are serving your customers. I mean, how's that going to work? How's it going to work for you to undermine what your team members are doing and them be expected to serve your customers in the best way possible. So they realize from the top down that if they take care of their employees, and I'm going to get specifically into how do they do this from, from my perspective anyways, uh, then that's going to trickle down into those employees then taking care of their customers. So it's all intertwined. It's all connected. And they realize that taking care of their employees is crucial. So that's number one. Uh, number two, meaning can be found in sweeping. All right. Again, these are in no particular order, but one thing that I was very, very impressed with was that when I got there and I'm going to talk about other parts of my experience, but when I got to this new facility and this is an unbelievable facility, it's nearly 200,000 square feet. I can't even imagine the investment, the financial investment, the amount of time and energy, uh, that, that went into making this what it is. But as I walked in there, it, it was interesting because as I was going from the front desk to the podcast room where Andy and I were going to record, I remember looking over and seeing in this hall and there was a, a young man and he was sweeping the floor. And he was, it, was, it was interesting because he was doing it in a way where he, was, he seemed happy about it. <laughs> he was sweeping the floor and he seemed genuinely happy about it. Like he was doing it right. He was paying attention to detail and he was smiling. He looked up, he, he greeted me, he said, hello. It, he was pleasant and he was sweeping the floors. All right. Now fast forward four hours later, cause that's how long Andy and I recorded for between his podcast and my podcast. Uh, I, I came out and I looked down that hall and there was another young man sweeping that same area, a, a different, a different guy sweeping that area. And he was sweeping it with the same positivity and mannerisms that the first young man was sweeping it with. He was happy. He seemed to be enjoying it. Uh, and he was pretty content and he was pleasant, looked up greeted me, said hello, and then went, went right back to his duty like he loved it. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't enjoy necessarily cleaning. Like that isn't a thing that 
I would place on a, a very high position within the, the list of things that I want to be doing on a daily basis. Like I don't like vacuuming. I don't like sweeping. I don't like dusting. I don't like doing the dishes. And I think that most of us would probably fall into that category as well. And yet I think there's a real reason why these two young men seem to be enjoying the opportunity to clean dirt off the floor. And I'm going to get into more of the reasons why I think that is as I talk with you about these other points. But it was very interesting to me that the team at First Form had created an environment where something is seemingly insignificant or trivial or more of a headache and a hassle than anything else was actually a pleasant experience. And how applicable can this be in our own lives? How often do you need to send emails or make a phone call or do go, go through some, some red tape or to do some paperwork and to jump through some hoops that, you know, isn't the most pleasant part of your job. And yet you can take something that you don't actually like doing. And if you attach meaning and purpose to it, which is what they've done at first form, then I think you're going to have not only a better time doing these things that you don't enjoy doing, you're going to achieve maximum results. And that facility was spotless. Now I realize it's new, but there wasn't any dust. There wasn't any debris. There wasn't anything like any dirt or cobwebs in the, I mean, there was nothing. It was, it was meticulous. In fact, I saw those two young men sweeping the same place within a four hour time period. And they were enjoying it. So if there's not a lesson there that says, man, we need to find meaning and purpose in what we're doing. And that way, the trivial tasks that need to be done on a daily basis don't become so painful or cumbersome or we reject and avoid them. In fact, I think we'll be excited to partake in those activities because we attach it to the meaning and the purpose and the uh, potential outcome that it has. All right, number three, you have to start with not optimal. Now, again, I'm really excited to be talking with you about this because I, I can't even fully express in words how incredible the space is. And, and it seems like maybe I'm, I'm brown nosing here a little bit. I, I realize that it's, it's not that at all. It, I, I was, I, I can't say it any other way than I was just, I was blown away. And, and I want to, I want to teach you guys the lessons. Like I want to see what the lessons are for me so I can improve my own life. And I want to share that with you. So it, I, I realize it might come across as brown nosing a little bit, but it's genuine excitement for what they were doing because I saw what was possible. And then that unlocks a new part of the way that I think about my business. And hopefully I can be uh, somewhat of a mediator for you to unlock part of your life and your business because you're hearing this. And that's my sole intent, not to brown nose. But one thing that was interesting is, like I said, this is a two, nearly 200,000 square foot facility. It's meticulous. It's beautiful. The attention to detail is, is unbelievable. And it's interesting because a lot of you guys know Andy's story. In fact, he talked a little bit about his story on the podcast that we did earlier in the week. And he started with a, a, a company called Supplement Superstores, I believe is what it's called. That, that was his first, his first company. In fact, he still has the, the original sign in, in their facility. And uh, he talks about the story of him and his business partner living in, in, the, in the place, in, in, this, in the store, in the back of the store on a piss-stained mattress. And he says, those piss-stains, by the way, weren't his. So he must have got that mattress out of the dumpster or at Goodwill or somewhere. And that's all they could do. And yet they made it work. And now you fast forward however long that's been. And they're in this absolutely phenomenal facility that is state of the art, that's beautiful. And that would be the envy of any manufacturing organization or company out there. So what I see a lot of guys fall into the trap of thinking is something along the lines of, and you know, you know, you're falling into this trap when you're thinking to yourself, well, yeah, if I had a facility like that, yeah, it must be nice to, to be in the position where you can spend millions and millions of dollars to have this facility guys, frankly, that type of thinking is bullshit. It's hindering you. It's limiting you because Andy didn't start that way. 
He started by living in the back of a probably rundown, small store, sleeping on a piss-stained mattress. And some of you are like, well, I guess, you know, I, I'm not even going to start because it's not going to be optimal. You have to be willing to start with something that's not optimal. When I started this podcast, for example, I was doing it in the basement of our other home in Utah in a spare bedroom that I had repurposed. In fact, there was still a mattress in there because when people came, they stayed in there. So I had a desk in the corner, I had a $60 microphone, and that was my space. Now I have my own podcast studio. I've got this professional mic. I've got lighting set up. I've got a, like a $2,000 camera here. I've got this other uh, upgraded webcam. I mean, like, but again, I started with nothing. And we've evolved it to where it is now. Guys, if you're not willing to start with not optimal, you're never going to get started and you're going to sell yourself short because you're running around thinking that, Whoever it is you admire and respect has everything figured out. I assure you, they didn't always have it figured out. And they evolved and they learned and they grew and they expanded and they uh, built out their capabilities and they developed skill sets so that they could put them in the position to earn the fruit of their effort, which is in this case to build this meticulous, incredible facility. But it didn't start there. And most people, again, will say, oh, that must be nice. That's ignorant thinking. It is nice. But when you're saying that, what you're saying is that, oh, if you had that, you could create that success too. Well, they didn't always have that. In fact, they started from less than humble beginnings. And now through their efforts and through their work, they're where they are today. That's number three. You have to start with not optimal. Number four. The attention to detail will set you apart. Now, as I walked through this facility, yeah, it was, it was beautiful, right? I mean, no doubt. And, and I fully expected it to be. But the amount of attention to detail was just, was staggering. So as I was leaving, I was kind of looking at some pictures on the wall and they had some, some different celebrations and milestones that they had hit. And I was just kind of wandering around, checking it all out. And I looked down the hall and, and I saw this, this barber pole. It was like an old school barber pole and it was spinning. It was really cool. And I'm like, what in the world's going on over there? So I walked down the hall and there's another guy cleaning. All right, he was mopping the floor. This a different person mopping the floor. So that goes back to what I was saying earlier. And he was excited about it. He looks up and I'm like, hey, can I come down here and check it out? He's like, yeah, come on down. And we sat and we talked for a minute and, and I got to that barber pole. Well, they've got a barber shop in there. And the, the chairs are amazing there. And I don't know the full story, but they, but the employee, the guys, the people there told me, they said the, these chairs were, uh, originally made, I think manufactured in St. Louis. They were at a barber shop in St. Louis. And then they went up to Massachusetts and, uh, anyways, they found them and they bought them and they brought them back. And then they sent them down to Texas to have them refurbished. And they're like gold plated where like you would think on the old school barber chairs where it's chrome, they're gold plated with black, beautiful, custom black leather. They're meticulous. They're incredible. And, and that's where I was like, oh my goodness. Like the, again, the attention to detail, everything was thought through. Well, across the hall, they've got this, the only way to describe it is a theater. It's like a movie theater. And there's probably, I don't know, maybe, a, maybe 150 to 200 seats, maybe even more individual seats. Well, this is where they do their training and their sales presentations and things like that. So you go in this room and it's stadium seating. So it's, it's elevated. Every row is slightly elevated more than the next. And every chair is leather. And if I remember correctly, anyways, and then every chair has the first form logo on it. Amazing. Amazing. So I go into Andy's office and he's got his, he's got his desk and he's got these chairs with the, uh, real AF, the spade that he uses in his logo. He's got that embroidered on each of the chairs. It's, it's engraved into the tables, the, from the color to the carpet, to the way the thing is set up to the view from Andy's office, which overlooks what I would, what I would liken to like maybe the bullpen a little bit. You think about the stock market, like it overlooks the bullpen a little bit. Is, that's how I describe it. And then on the other side of it, it overlooks the gym and a full size basketball court in there. I mean, this thing is unbelievable, but even the basketball court, I was talking with, uh, 
uh, a gentleman who was helping out with a podcast and he was very excited because he designed the floor for the basketball court from the box to the logo to the coloring on the basketball court itself. And the excitement in his voice was, was actually really cool to hear because he, he was excited. That was his baby. That was his pro one of his projects. And so he was excited. He had, he had the opportunity to do that. And again, the attention to detail, everything was just meticulous. It's very easy for us to overlook those things, thinking, oh, people won't see that. That's not a big deal. You guys have all heard Andy talk about wiping the pee drops off the toilet seat. Guys, that's not rhetoric. That isn't just some empty talk or cute little marketing tagline. or any, like, It's legitimately true. It isn't, it isn't to hype you up. It isn't to fake you out. It isn't to make you think that he's doing something that he actually is doing because I'm telling you, that building is meticulous. Everything about it is phenomenal. All right. Uh, I hope this is helping. I mean, really, again, my, my goal is to serve you and give you some information. A lot, In fact, a lot of you guys, I was surprised. I wasn't planning on doing this, but a lot of you guys asked about my experience and asked about the facility itself. And I thought, all right, well, if that's what you're interested in, I'll share this with you. Uh, but, but I hope what you're doing in listening to me share this stuff is not bragging on their facility. That's not the point. I hope that what you're doing is learning how you can apply this own stuff into your life, whether it's at your office, your place of work, uh, your own house, your, your own space, your car, like the things that I'm talking about and your environment are crucial. And I hope that you're taking these uh, 10 lessons and you're thinking about how you can apply them in your life. That is the, that is the point. All right. Number, I think we're on number five, <clears throat> get out of people's way. All right. If you have good people in your life and you should, if they're not good people in your life, they shouldn't be in your life. So we've got to assume whether that's employees or just friends. Like if you don't trust your employees, for example, well, you hired them. So that's on you. That's your fault. <laughs> not theirs. Oh, my employees, they don't know what they're doing and they, 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 they aren't working hard. Well, okay. You, again, you hired them. You trained them. So whose fault is that really? That Now that's not to say anything about the team at first form. I mean, the, the people there were obviously amazing. I'm going to get into some more of that here in a minute. But what I noticed is that if you just get out of people's way, like you have good employees, you have good people around you, you hired right, you trained them correctly, then just get out of their way. So I went into their warehouse. So up until this point, I've been talking about their their more of their office portion of the building. So I went afterwards, uh, I, I was fortunate enough to get a tour I had multiple employees offer me personal tours. And I took somebody up on that, uh, that offer and they took me out into the warehouse to show me the warehouse. Well, the warehouse manager and his name escapes me right now. I wish it didn't, but, but, uh, anyways, he comes over and he stops what he was doing and he starts talking about his warehouse and where things are and how it's set up. And they're going to start building some batting cages. So, uh, members of the, the Cardinals and college and, and high school teams can come take batting practice when the weather's bad, they're in the facility. And he was so excited about this portion of the building because it was his, it was his. And he told me a story. He said, you know, um, I went, I went to, uh, to Sal and Andy one day and I just expressed my gratitude for them letting me be here and helping me grow and letting me run this part of the organization. And both of them were like, what are you talking about? Like, this is your baby. This is your, like, well, you're thanking us, but we should be thanking you for everything that you've done and organizing this place and, 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 and creating the systems and making sure it all runs smoothly and there's no kinks. And if things go down that we're back up immediately and bringing the right people in and both Andy and Sal, and I'm assuming the rest of the leadership team wasn't, didn't feel like they had given him something. They felt like that individual, that employee was, was giving them something. And I think that's indicative of a leadership team that a hires good people, B trains them well, and then C gets the hell out of the way, drops the ego and lets that individual flourish and thrive and do their thing. But how often have we been part of organizations and how often have we as men been guilty of this? Whether it's a, a, a father capacity or an employer, boss, taskmaster capacity, how often have we been guilty of bogging down the system 
because of our pride and our arrogance and our ego when we would have been better served our employees would have been better served or our family members and our customers would have been better served if we would just get out of the way and let those great people do what they do and learn from them and just create an environment where they can thrive and then back up and let them thrive the way that you hired them to do. I didn't take away from any of my experience that the leadership team at First Form were taskmasters, were micromanagers. I got the impression, again, based on my limited experience, I mean, I wasn't there for more than a day, but I got the impression that they trusted their team members, trusted them so much that they let them do their thing. And they got out of the way, and I think it was much more efficient. And you could see the buy-in from that, from that man and how excited he was for, for, his, for his place. All right, number, I think I'm on number six. I should have numbered these. I, I, I never number them, and I always should. <laughs> uh, but number six is make people feel special, and they're per, they'll perform better. Make people feel special, and they're, they'll perform better. So the reason I, I wrote this down as a point is not necessarily – treating your employees special, although that would fall into this category, but they treated me special. Like when I walked in there, I was greeted immediately, immediately. Actually, I got to the door and there was a code on the door and somebody came right over, opened it up, asked why I was here. I told them why I was here. They're like, cool, come on in. They brought me to the front desk. The, the gal there got my information. She took my temperature because of the COVID thing. I mean, very professional. Um, and then as I was walking around, people were smiling. I had people come up and shake my hand. Many of them knew my name. I, I imagine part of that is because they listened to the podcast and they knew I was coming, but they knew I was coming. So obviously that word had gotten out and everybody treated me like, well, frankly, like a rock star. I, I was, I was blown away. I felt, I felt very special being there. Like I felt important. And that I think is the point is that the team made their guests feel important, right? How often do we fail to make people feel important because we're busy or we're consumed or we have a deadline to meet and we overlook making people feel special and making people feel important. And as a leader, I think we have an opportunity to get the most, this is going to sound weird, but to get the most out of people when you make them feel special. And by the way, getting the most out of somebody is not the reason. It's not the primary reason I should say that you'd make somebody feel special. You should just want to make people feel special because you like people and you want them to win. Like, I think that's probably the best motive, but also is if you treat people special, they're going to perform for you. Here's a great example. If I didn't have the experience that I had at First Form, if it was diminished or tainted in any way, do you think I'd be talking about it on this podcast? And if I was talking about it, I'd be talking about it from a negative perception. But instead, because they went out of their way to make me feel special, I had people, multiple people, half a dozen people, hey, can I give you a personal tour? And they'd, they'd leave whatever it is they were doing. They'd come up, they'd shake my hand. Somebody offered to, to go train with them in the gym, like, they went out of their way to acknowledge that I was there and to extend gratitude and, and gracious gestures in me being there. And because that's the case, I'm now performing, frankly, for them, right? Because I'm talking, I'm talking up the company because I had such a great experience. So if that isn't a perfect example, I, I don't know what is. Now, they're also doing that for their employees, and because they're doing that for their employees, their employees feel special and feel important and want to be part of the team and are so great, grateful to have the opportunity to be there and they perform at their highest possible level because they feel important, not just some cog in the wheel. So make people feel important. Uh, number seven, let me just make a note right here. Yeah, number seven, culture is critical. Culture is critical. You're not there just to get tasks done whether we're talking about a family or a team or an organization or your business or your city council or your fellow school board members or PTA or whatever organization you, you, you belong to, whatever capacity you're serving is that the culture is critical. If all you do is get wrapped up on the task uh, and, and, and maximum production and just cranking things out and treating people like they're cogs in the wheel 
and the bottom line is the most important thing, then you know you're prob- you, you could have some success with that, but it isn't going to be long term. You're you're going to get compliance from people because they have to do it because they need a paycheck, right? They got to put food on the table, they got to make their mortgage or their rent, and so you're going to get compliance, but you're not going to get uh, buy-in from them. They're not going to be completely committed to what you're doing. They're not going to be those loyal individuals who will will stick by you through thick and thin. We'll go through the ups and downs. We'll do everything under their power to help you guys thrive and win. If you don't know what your organization stands for, then it's very easy to get deterred and get off track. And there's phrases. I know they're having team meetings. There is a, a definite culture. It's palpable. You walk in, you can feel it, and every employee there lives it. And, and it just exudes from them. I, 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 I experienced it. It's, it's incredible. When you create a culture of excellence, a culture of performance, a culture of making people feel special, all the points I've been talking with you about today, that's their culture. And they talk about it frequently. They discuss it. They share it. They live it. They call each other out on it, which I'm going to get to here in a point in, in a second. But culture is important. And because all of them communicate it and all of them know what it is, they all perform to the culture, to the standard that is expected. All right, number eight. And this is what I, was, I, I alluded to just a second ago, but the absence of confrontation does not equal care or love. Andy and I actually talked about this, I think on both of our podcasts, but we talked about th- that love is, is not the absence of confrontation because modern culture and the doctrine of popular culture would have you believe that if you love somebody, you just need to make them feel special about themselves, you know? You don't want any confrontation. You don't want them to feel awkward or uncomfortable or, or scared or any of that kind of stuff. Like you're just supposed to bubble wrap them. That, that's what modern culture will tell you. Modern society will say, just, just ease up on them. Just love them. Love them for who they are. Accept their mediocrities. That's what culture says. Okay, but that isn't, con- that is, that isn't love. And it's not conducive to their growth. Sometimes love means being confrontational. Sometimes love means calling somebody out. Sometimes love and care means that you have to tell people they're not doing or reaching their potential. And I know that's uncomfortable and I know that's awkward, but that's, that's how it works. If you really cared about somebody, you would be so concerned with their growth and their progression that you would actually do the things that need to be done and say the things that need to be said in order for that person to grow and evolve and expand. And that doesn't mean you're bubble wrapping them. Sometimes it means, hey, I love you, but I know you can do better. And why don't you come back to me when you've proven to me that you've done better? Now, people will say, oh man, that's threatening. That's scary. That's a microaggression. No, it just means I know that you're capable of more and I think so highly of you. I care so much about you that I'm willing to tell you you're capable of more. And when you do that, because I know that that's what these guys at First Form do, when you do that, you get the best out of your people. And they're excited about it. They're excited about, for example, sweeping the floor and, and a meticulous attention to detail that they, that they get all the dirt, not just some of the dirt, not just the dirt you see, they get all of it swept up. Or when they're performing inferior, they, they present an inferior product to you. In fact, I would argue that very rarely, and I don't know this for sure, but I assume that very rarely does an inferior product even get presented to the leadership team because they've been doing this for so long that the people presenting the projects and the ideas and whatever it is they're presenting know it has to be the best. And now because somebody cared enough about them to not worry so much about being comfortable, but to actually say the things that need to be said and do the things that need to be done, now those individuals are performing to the highest standard possible. And that is love. That is care. It's not the absence of confrontation. All right, number nine. Image is important. Uh, People resonate with beauty. Image is important. People resonate with beauty. Like this is crucial. 
it's funny because one context I hear this quite often is, well, real men, real men. And anytime somebody says real men, you take whatever they say with a grain of salt afterwards. I, I don't know that I've ever said, well, real men do this. Okay, but real men don't care about how they look. Okay, that, that phrase is misguided at best. Like it's ignorant, it's misguided, and it's actually hypocritical. Because if you didn't care about, for example, how you looked, you'd probably just run around naked. Because being naked is, you know, way more comfortable than wearing clothes. Okay, so, but you do care about you, how you look. And even if you are dressing down because you don't want people to think you care about how you look, well, by definition, you actually care about how you look, so you're trying to dress like you don't care. Here's a great example. The grunge movement in the, what, 90s? Right? It was all about like, I don't care. I don't. And so what did people start doing? They started deliberately ripping holes in their jeans, deliberately wearing baggy flannel shirts because we don't care how we look. Well, actually you're wearing a uniform. <laughs> people don't realize that the grunge scene, that's a uniform. If you want to know more about this, you can talk with my friend Tanner Guzzi and, and follow him because he's got some good information on this. So even the guys that say, well, I don't care how about how, what I look like, so I'm just going to wear whatever I want. Okay, well, then you actually do care about what you look like. Now, that's a long preface and maybe a little sidetrack from what I wanted to share with you. Uh, but don't fall into the trap of believing that the way you look or the way you present yourself or the way you present projects or uh, the way that, that people may perceive them is not important. Like, if, if, I, if I fell into that trap... I wouldn't worry about upgrading my cameras. I wouldn't worry about uh, the microphone I'm using. I wouldn't worry about this blue light I have. I wouldn't worry about the things that are behind me. I wouldn't worry about the way that I present myself to you. And it's not disingenuous. Some people think, oh, well, you're just gaming the system. No, I'm just trying to present the best possible version of myself. I'm, I'm not out of integrity because I care about that. In fact, I think I'm in integrity. I care so much about the message I'm sharing with you that I want to make sure that the way I present it is in a way that you can receive it the best and apply it to your life. Well, first form knows this. And so their office is beautiful. I mean, it's, it's phenomenal from the color. They've got uh, Ryan Hardwick's car in there. They've got phrases that are, that are on the wall. I saw Andy's new podcast studio. We didn't get to record in his new studio because they're still doing some work in there, but um, the way they have it set up and the lighting, uh, and, and the sign that's put up there and the way that the, the organization and the facility is laid out and the colors that they're using and everything. In fact, while we were there, they were working on some audio equipment in the gym. I mean, everything is thought out. Every single piece of, of, uh, equipment in the gym is there that bluish teal color, like the first form color. Every part of the gym is that color. And that's not a standard color. That's a custom color. They know that people are attracted to, I say beautiful, like I don't know if beautiful is the right term, but aesthetics, we'll say aesthetics. Aesthetics are important and they know that. If all their stuff looks like shit, like how excited are you going to be to share it? Like if I went in there and I was kind of like, it was kind of drab in there, there wasn't enough lighting, it didn't look very nice, all the colors were whack and out of, out of, out of place and just weird. You think I'd be talking about it right now? Of course not. Part of the reason my experience was so great is because I walked in there and I was blown away with the aesthetics of it. People care about the way things look and the way things look are actually, actually a representation of, of you and how you perform. So, so consider this, you're, you're tasked with the, with the job of hiring two new people for your team at, at the company. And one guy walks in and he's clean and he's sharp and he's well-groomed, and he's wearing the appropriate attire. He's not overdressed, but he's certainly not underdressed. If anything, he's slightly better dressed than maybe the position he's, qual or he's applying for. And he just looks the part. And on the opposite side, you have another gentleman who comes in, and he's in the grunge outfit, right? He's got dirty jeans on. He's kind of a slob. He hasn't taken care of himself. You instantaneously know who you're going to hire. Before they even open their mouths, now, some of you will say, well, that's not fair. You shouldn't judge a book by its cover. Well, cool, but we all do, you included. Anybody who says that also does the same thing. Why? Because we know that the guy who pays attention 
to the way that he presents himself probably does things in, in his life that are similar when he presents to a client, uh, when he uh, presents projects and tasks at work, it's safe to assume that if he cares so much about himself that he wants to put his best foot forward and present himself in the best light possible, that he'll do that in other facets of his life as well. And so you know before either one of those individuals open their mouths if you're willing to explore it further. Now, it doesn't guarantee that you're going to hire that individual, but it certainly gives you a leg up. It gives you a huge advantage. So the aesthetics matter. When you're putting products and information and, and things, services out into the world, then make sure it's the best. And again, I'm going to go back to that point I said earlier about you have to be willing to start with not optimal. But that doesn't mean you need to remain there forever. Can you imagine First Forms facility with a bunch of piss stained mattresses in that facility now? Well, obviously it wouldn't be congruent with what they're creating and what they're trying to portray. Again, it doesn't make them disingenuous. In fact, it, it makes it more genuine because they're trying to present themselves in the best light possible. Same thing with dating. You know, just because you dress up and you clean up and, and, and you treat her with, with dignity and respect, does that mean you're disingenuous? No, it just means that you want to present yourself in the best light possible because you'd like to have a relationship with this woman. There's nothing wrong with that, but you need to understand how crucial and important it is. Uh, all right, the last one, guys, I'm going to share with you, and this is point number 10 because I think this is going a lot longer than, than maybe I thought it would, but uh, all of this stuff is crucial, is uh, hyper-focus on your own performance, not others. It's very easy to get caught up and wrapped up in what other people are doing and other organizations are doing. And then if you get caught up in that, you might fall into the trap of comparing yourself to what they're doing or bad mouthing them in front of other people, uh, in front of pr prospects. Like none of that stuff is good. And I'm not saying you shouldn't look at what your competition is doing. I'm not saying that you shouldn't be aware of what other companies and organizations are doing to perform, you should be aware of that. But don't be so focused on it that it comes at the expense of you performing yourself. Be so hyper-focused on your own improvement, whether it's in an organization or your own personal growth, that comparing yourself to other people or even falling into the trap of fear of missing out based on what other people are doing is just not an issue for you. I know, for example, when I, when I compare myself to other people, and I start look, like feeling bad, like, oh, look what they're doing, and I'm not hanging out with them, so I'm not having fun. That's because I'm not busy enough. That's all it is. Like, if I would just get busy and live my life, like, I wouldn't even have time to look at what those individuals are doing and what I'm quote-unquote missing out on. And I'm certainly not going to back talk or uh, talk bad about them. Why would I do that? I, I, I don't have enough time to talk bad about somebody else. Because I've got my own things going on and I'm so hyper-focused on my own growth, my own improvement, the organization's improvement and growth that I'm not worried about what Joe Schmo over here is doing. I, in fact, I wish him luck. I, I hope he succeeds to the level that he wants. In fact, I'll help. If he reaches out, I'll help him. But be so hyper-focused on your own results, your own journey and progress that you just don't have time to get stuck in the mud uh, focusing on somebody else's. And Andy and I talked about that at length on our, on our podcast as well. Like he doesn't back, talk bad about other companies. He doesn't bash other companies. In fact, he helps them. He gave an example in that podcast. I think it was, I, I can't remember if it was on his or mine, but we, we talked about an experience that I had that he wasn't even aware of that I knew because I had some friends in common and, uh, and it was, it was what, what, what could be considered like a competitor. And yet it wasn't competitive. It was cooperation, which was amazing. Because he's so focused on growth, he's not threatened by what other organizations and companies are doing. So anyways, th those are some of the lessons I learned. Like I said, I wasn't planning on doing this, but a lot of you guys asked about my experience. And so I thought I'd share. Um, if that doesn't make you think more highly of what they're doing over at First Form, I really don't know what will. Uh, they didn't pay me to do any of this. I know, I know it may come across as, as potentially brown nosing. So be it. You know, that I, really, for me, it was uh, just getting you some information that I think will serve you. It certainly served me. Like I'm better off because I went there because it expanded my perspective of running an organization and running a business and leading effectively. It was a very, very powerful experience for me. And I, and I hope that I can translate some of that to you. That's the whole point of this, right? Is to give you guys tools and insights that I have or I have access to or conversations with people that I know uh, and then taking that information and distilling it packaging in a way that's consumable that you can apply in your own life. So let me just recap 
Then we'll call it a day. You guys can get to your weekend and everything else you have going on. Uh, number one, your customers are your customers, but so is your team. So take care of both. Number two, meaning can be found in sweeping. If you have purpose and meaning, the trivial stuff isn't as rough. In fact, it can be enjoyable. Uh, number three, you have to start with not optimal. Okay, it's easy to say, well, it must be nice if I had this beautiful 200,000 multi-million dollar facility, well, then I would, I would be successful too. No, that's not how it works. It's not how it works. You earn it first and then you, you, you uh, reap the, the, the reward by earning it first and starting where you can, even if, even if it means sleeping on piss-stained mattresses. Uh, number four, attention to detail will set you apart. Number five, get out of good people's way. Just get out of their way. You hired them, you trained them. If they're not good and they need all your micromanagement and everything else, that's on you. That's not on them. Hire great people, train them effectively, treat them special, which is another point that I made, uh, and then get out of their way and let them do what you hired them to do or what you brought them on the team to do. Uh, number six, make people feel special. I just said that, uh, and they'll perform better. Make people feel special and important. It's not hard to do. It's so easy to do. It just takes a little effort and it goes a very, very long way. Uh, number seven, culture is critical. Number eight, the absence of confrontation does not necessarily equal care or love. Number nine, image is important. People resonate with beauty or aesthetics. Uh, and then number 10, hyper-focus on your own performance, not others. So there you go, guys. That was my experience, a little bit of my experience anyways, uh, and some lessons that I extracted. Um, people, sometimes, some people uh, kind of find it interesting or funny that I, that I pull these lessons out and extract these lessons. I would actually encourage you to do the same thing. Like I look at every opportunity and every experience I have as a learning lesson. And, and I feel like if we can do that, even the negative experiences that I have, like I had, a, I had an opportunity one time to take my son to a bow shop uh, and, and I took him in and I won't get into all the details. I've shared this in the past, but the guy at the bow shop was a complete asshole. There's no other way to say it. he was a complete asshole. And my son saw it. And I thought, man, this sucks. My son's watching this. And as I left the store, I was like, no, that was actually good. <laughs> like that was good for my son to see it. And so him and I had a conversation about, how he felt and how that guy came across. And it was a negative experience, but we turned it into a positive because we were willing to reflect upon it. So, uh, this is something I do is uh, I just write down. I mean, I've got notes, like I write down notes. I'm like, Hey, that was cool. That was interesting. Here's what I learned. Here's what I took away. Here's what I could apply to my life. And so this is something I try to, to do is to reflect and, and, and internalize a lot of the lessons that could be very easily overlooked if we didn't have that mentality. So anyways, guys, again, I hope it serves you. Um, you know, let me know, Shoot, hit, hit me up on the, the socials. Instagram's probably best. That's where I'm most active at Ryan Mickler. Um, tag me in your comments. Maybe there's some, some lessons that, that you've had or learned, uh, by being part of an organization or starting your own organization, uh, that we can learn from. So just tag me, let me know what you guys are learning. Uh, make sure to go back and listen to my podcast on uh, Real AF and then listen to Andy coming on, on mine. Uh, in fact, I will say that on Tuesday when we released my interview with Andy, it was the single highest downloaded day of podcasting since I started podcasting five and a half years ago. So we set all kinds of records with that, which is a testament to how powerful that podcast was and also you sharing that information. So I do want to let you know, I appreciate you sharing this stuff. Uh, it goes a very long way. If it helps you and you share it, then it's certainly going to help another man. I don't have it all figured out, but I hope there's some lessons that I'm able to impart upon you uh, that will serve you in some way as a father, a husband, leader in your community, owner of your business, uh, whatever it is that you're, you're doing and however you're serving. All right, guys, make it a great weekend. Spend some time with your family. Work your tail off if that's the case. Whatever you're doing, be fully present. Uh, we'll catch you next week. Until then, go out there, take action, and become the man you are meant to be.